is not just about the next four years or the next eight years, it's the entire direction our country takes for generations to come. And that decision is going to start right here in Iowa. So thank you very much for your investment of this time to get it right. I appreciate it. Um, I thought what I'd do today is I tell you a little bit about myself, tell you a little bit about why I'm in this race. Uh, we'll do some questions, and then anybody who wants to, I'll stay and we'll do selfies. That is now the new measure of democracy, so we'll get that done. Um, I was born and raised in Oklahoma. Dead silence. Not a single OG out there or anybody with even ties. Uh, it's okay, there aren't that many of us. Um, I uh, have three much older brothers. Uh, I was what used to be known as a late-in-life baby. Uh, my mother always just called me the surprise. Um, uh, my three older brothers are all retired. They're all back in Oklahoma now. They are to this day collectively referred to as the boys to distinguish them from the surprise. Um, all three of my brothers joined the military. My oldest brother, Don Reed, was in combat in Vietnam off and off, off and on for about five and a half years. We were really lucky to get him back home. Uh, my second brother, John, was stationed overseas for a little over a year. My third brother, David, trained as a combat medic. Uh, that has given rise to a rule in our family. <laughs> Never choke in front of David. Uh, to this day, the man carries a sharpened pocket knife and is convinced he can perform an emergency tracheotomy. Um, uh, makes for some exciting Thanksgivings. Um, I love my brothers. I'm close to my brothers. When we were growing up, our daddy had a lot of different jobs. He sold fencing. He sold carpet. He sold paint. He sold housewares. And when uh, I was in middle school, by then the boys were all gone. So it was just my mom and my dad and me. And my daddy had a heart attack. Um, it was serious. He recovered. But he couldn't work for a long, long time. And um, I still remember the day that we lost our family station wagon. Um, I remember how my mother used to tuck me in at night and she would kiss me on the forehead and pull up my blankets and she'd always give me this big smile and leave the room and I knew what was coming next. She'd walk out, she'd close the door and I'd hear her start to cry. Um, she never wanted to cry in front of me. Um, this is the time in my life when I learned words like mortgage and foreclosure. Um, and one day I walked into my folks' bedroom and laid out on the bed was the dress. Now some of you in this audience will know the dress. It's the one that only comes out for weddings, funerals, and graduations. And down by the foot of the bed is my mother. She's in her slip and she's in her stocking feet. She's got her head down and she's pacing and saying, we will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. She was 50 years old. She had never worked outside the home and she was terrified. Um, and I'm just a kid. I'm standing in the doorway and finally she looks up and sees me there. She doesn't say a word. She just looks at me, and she looks at that dress, and she looks back at me, and she wipes her face off, walks over, picks up the dress and pulls it on, puts on her high heels, and walks to the Sears and gets a full-time minimum wage job answering phones. That minimum wage job saved our house, and it saved our family. And for many years, I have thought of this as what my mother taught me. And that is, no matter how scared you are, and no matter how hard it looks, when it comes down to it, you reach down deep, you find what you have to find, you pull it up, and you take care of the people you love. It was years after that 
that I came to understand. That wasn't just what my mother taught me. It's what millions of people across this country do every day, no matter how scared they are and no matter how hard it looks. They reach down deep, they find what they have to find, they pull it up, they take care of themselves and they take care of the people they love. We're Americans, that's what we do. But it was only years later that I came to understand that same story about my mother is also a story about government. Because when I was a girl, a full-time minimum wage job in America would support a family of three. It would pay a mortgage, it would cover the utilities, and it would put groceries on the table. Today, a full-time minimum wage job in America will not keep a mama and a baby out of poverty. That is wrong, and that is why I am in this fight. There it is. And understand this, that difference is no accident. It didn't just automatically happen over time. That difference is about who government works for. When I was a girl, the question asked about the minimum wage is, what does it take a family of three to make it in America? What does it take to be able to give a family a foothold in America's middle class a chance to build something solid that they can then build a future? on. Today, the question asked in Washington is where do we set the minimum wage to maximize the profits of giant multinational corporations? Well, I don't want a government that works for giant multinational corporations. I want a government that works for our families. That's why I'm here. Now, for me, the, like I said, the boys, they all joined the military. It was a path to America's middle class and service that they wanted to do. I always had a different dream. I have known what I wanted to be since second grade. You may laugh, some of you didn't decide till what, like fourth grade? <laughs> Fifth grade in the back row, right? No, I've known what I wanted to be since second grade, and I've actually never varied from it. I wanted to be a public school teacher. Can we hear it for America's public school teacher? <laughs> oh, and I invested early. I used to line my dollies up and teach school. Uh, I had a reputation for being tough but fair. Uh, I knew this is what I wanted to do. But by the time I graduated from high school, my family didn't have the money for a college application, much less to send me off to four years at university. So, like a lot of Americans, I do not have a straight line story. I got a lot of twists and turns in my story. So here's how my story goes. I was a high school debater, and I got a scholarship to college. Woohoo! Uh, it was fun. Um, and then, at 19, I fell in love, got married, and dropped out of school. Yay! <laughs> now, it's what I chose. Nobody made me do this. And it's going to be a good life. But I thought I'd given up on the dream. I thought, that's it. I'm never going to get to teach school. So we're living down in Houston, Texas, just outside Houston. And then I found it. 45 minutes away, a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. And for a price I could pay for on a part-time waitressing job, I finished my four-year diploma. I became a special education teacher. I have lived my dream job. That's what opportunities are. Now, I, do we have any public school teachers in here? Do we have any or people who... But they're all still in school. I got one, two, right? Uh, a couple of public school teachers. I'm going to need you to back me up on this, okay? It's not a job. It's calling. I loved the work. I had four to six-year-olds to this day. I can still remember those babies. Um, I loved them. And I probably would still be doing that work today, but my story's got some more twists and turns. So here's how the story goes. By the end of the first year in teaching, 
I was visibly pregnant. And the principal did what principals did in those days. He wished me luck and hired someone else for the job. So there I am. I'm at home. I got a baby. I can't get a job. I got to do something. So I'll go to law school. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, now, by this point, we're living in New Jersey. I found a public law school that cost $450 a semester. And baby on hip, I head off and do three years in law school. I graduated from law school visibly pregnant. You will discover a pattern to these stories. Um, I took the bar, passed the bar, and practiced law for 45 minutes. <laughs> and then I returned to my first love, teaching. I traded little ones for much bigger ones, and I have spent most of my grown-up life teaching in law school. Um, other significant changes in my life, husband number one, hint, it is never good when you have to number your husbands. <laughs> husband number one and I separated, and uh, but... I ended up with Bruce, and I still got him, and life came back together. So those pieces worked. Um, but here's the thing. Teaching in law school, I don't know if everybody does this, but for me, growing up in a family that was kind of hanging on to its place in the middle class by our fingernails, I wanted to teach about money. I wanted to learn it and then teach it. So if it was about money, count me in. I taught contract law and commercial law, secure transactions, payment systems, corporate finance, uh, partnership finance, debtor creditor law, bankruptcy law, law and economics. If it was about money, I was there. But there was always one central question in my work, and that is, what's happening to working families in America? Why is America's middle class being hollowed out? Why is it? that people who work every bit as hard as my mother worked two generations ago find the path today so much rockier and so much steeper. And for people of color, even rockier and even steeper. And the answer is like the answer on minimum wage. It's about who government works for. Think of it this way. We have a government in Washington works great for giant drug companies, but not for people trying to get a prescription filled. It works great for people who want to make money investing in private prisons and private detention centers down at our borders, just not for the people whose lives are destroyed by those places. It is a government that works great for giant oil companies who want to drill everywhere just not for the rest of us who see climate change bearing down upon us. And when you see a government that works great for those who have money and is not working so great for much of anyone else, that is corruption, pure and simple, and we need to call it out for what it is. Corruption. And the money is felt everywhere in Washington. Think of it this way. Whatever issue brought you here today, whether it is the cost of prescription drugs or climate or any issue at all, if there's a decision to be made in Washington, it's been influenced by money. It's been shaped by money. It's had loopholes carved out by money. It's been nudged by money. Money that seeps everywhere through the system. In fact, I want to tell you one quick story about this. You go back to the early 1990s and you'll see that the scientists understood about climate change. And they were already telling us. They said, this is a real problem. We cannot keep putting this much carbon into our air and our water. It's going to be a disaster for everybody. And, yeah, they were calling it global warming. They didn't quite have the numbers, but they had the basic. And not just a few scientists. I mean, the scientists really understood this. Here's the thing. In Washington, Democrats and Republicans were working together. 
They were asking questions like, do we need to expand the Environmental Protection Agency? Do we need new regulations? Do we need to put more money into cleanup? And then along came the Koch brothers. Mm, yeah, you've heard of the Koch brothers, right? The Koch brothers and big oil and some of the big polluters. They come along and they say, in effect, to each other, wow. You know, if Washington gets really serious about this climate thing, that's going to bite into our bottom line. That's going to cut into our profits. So they've got a decision to make, an investment decision. They could decide, we're backing out of petroleum-based because that's not the, no, they don't do that. They could decide, we're going to put all of our R&D money into how to clean up the air, how to clean up the, way, right, how to take carbon. They don't. They make an investment. They decide to invest in politicians in Washington. And how do they do that? They spread their money everywhere. Campaign contributions, lobbyists, PR firms, think tanks, bought and paid for experts. This is the part that just really gets me. These guys, you've seen these climate deniers, right? The guys who stand up and say, I'm a doctor. And as a doctor, um, I just want to say that climate's been here a long time. The dinosaurs loved it. It was good for growing salad. I mean, it's this like crazy stuff. You should ask yourself, why is someone spending tens of millions of dollars to lift that up, to pay these people to write these reports, to get that out there and magnify it? And the answer, those bought and paid for experts can build one thing. They can build an umbrella that politicians can then hide under so that politicians can keep taking Koch brother money and keep taking big oil money and keep taking big polluter money. And if they get asked about it, they say, oh, gee, I don't know, the science is controversial, I'm not a scientist, and keep taking in the money. You want to understand the climate crisis we face today? It is 25 years of corruption in Washington that brought us here. There it is. There it is. So with money so influential in Washington, what's it going to take to make change, real change? It's not going to happen with one little statute over here, a couple of regulations over there. It's going to take big structural change. And for me, that starts with attacking the corruption head on. We've played defense long enough. It's time to go on offense. And here's the good news. I have the biggest anti-corruption plan since Watergate. I do. I do. Here's the bad news. We need the biggest anti-corruption plan since Watergate. So you wouldn't be surprised. It is a big plan. It's got a lot of pieces because money is not only about campaign contributions. It's about all of it. So let me just give you some pieces from it. Part one. End lobbying as we know it. Yeah. <laughs> Block the revolving door between Wall Street and Washington. Enough. Here's one you may never have thought about but really matters. And that is make the United States Supreme Court follow basic rules of ethics on conflicts of interest. That is, yeah. I could do these all day, but I'm going to do just one more. And then, as you really want to hose out some corruption, make everyone who runs for federal office put their tax returns online. That's it. So, part one attack the corruption head on. Because when you attack the corruption head on, now you've got a chance to make some other changes, to make this democracy work, not just for the folks who got the money, to make it work for everyone. So for me, structural change in the economy. We got a problem in this country, and the problem is about giant corporations and how much power they have. These are the corporations that have swallowed up little businesses, swallowed up medium-sized businesses, swallowed up big businesses, and now they have got so much power. They can run over their own employees, 
They can run over their own customers. They can run over the communities where they're located. And they can run over the folks in Washington and get just what they want. We need a president with the courage to enforce our antitrust laws and break these giants up. Big Ag, I'm talking about you. Yep. That's part one. But part two, we need some structural change in another sense. And that is we need more power in the hands of workers. We need to make it easier for workers to join a union and to give unions more power when they negotiate. That's how you get change. Unions built America's middle class and unions will rebuild America's middle class. You bet it is. Let me give you one more. It's time for a wealth tax in America. Yeah. So here's my idea for wealth tax in America. Um, the idea is on the great fortunes in this country, above $50 million. So just so everyone can relax, or maybe everyone, um, your first $50 million is free and clear. Okay, I see somebody in the back. Okay, first 50 mil, free and clear. But on your 50 millionth and first dollar, you got to pitch in two cents. And two cents on every dollar above that uh, until you hit a billion dollars in assets and then a few pennies more. Okay, that's the basic idea behind it. And by the way, anybody in here own a home, own a farm, grow up in a family that owned a home? Anybody? Yeah. You've been paying a wealth tax forever. It's just called a property tax. And all I'm saying is for the top one-tenth of one percent, the big fortunes in this country, your property tax should be about more than your real estate. It should also include your stock portfolio, the diamonds, the Rembrandt, and the yacht. <laughs> just cover it all. Two cents. Two cents. And you know, you're going to be shocked to hear this. There are some billionaires who've taken exception to this idea, <laughs> who really don't like it. Uh, so they've been doing all kinds of things. Uh, they've complained about it. They've gone on TV and cried. Uh, uh, they've decided to run for president. Um, they've urged their friends to run for president, right? This is because they don't want to have to do this. And, and they argue back. They say, well, but I built this fortune. I worked hard. Um, so you shouldn't, you shouldn't tax it. And my view on this is to say, look, you built a great fortune in this country. Good for you. Good for you. You had a great idea and you wrote it all the way through. Good for you. Good for you. But here's the deal. You built a great fortune here in America. I guarantee you built it at least in part using workers all of us help pay to educate. I guarantee you built it at least in part getting your goods to market on roads and bridges all of us help pay to build. You built it at least in part protected by police and firefighters all of us help pay the salaries for. And we're Americans. We're glad to do that because we believe in opportunity. We believe in making these investments together so you do have this chance. All we're saying is if you make it big, I mean really big, I mean top one-tenth of one percent big, pitch in two cents so everybody else gets a chance to make it in this country. Two cents. Two cents. Now here comes the fun part. What can you do for two cents? And the answer, I'll tell you where I start, for two cents on that wealth tax, we can provide universal child care for every baby in this country age zero to five. What an opportunity for young families. We can invest and create universal pre-K for every three-year-old and four-year-old in America, fully paid for. We can stop exploiting the people who do this work. We can raise the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher in America. can do all that for our babies, plus we can make an historic $800 billion investment in all of our public schools, K through 12. Think about that. I'm making five cents. I got a man over here who's bidding with me here. I love it. I love it. 
But the thing is, this is what's so amazing. That two cents does all of that for our babies, puts $800 billion of new federal money across the board into our public K-12 for all of our kids. Plus, it will let us pay for tuition-free post-high school, technical school, two-year college, four-year college. Invest in the education of all our kids. It'll let us help level the playing field and put $50 billion into our historically black colleges and universities. And that same two cents that will do all that for our babies, all that for K-12, and all that for our kids post high school will let us cancel student loan debt for 43 million Americans. So for me, that's part two. Part one, attack the corruption head on. Part two is make some structural change in this economy. And part three, we gotta protect our democracy. We just gotta. So here's where I think we ought to start. We need a constitutional amendment to protect the right of every American citizen to vote and to get that vote counted. You bet. We need a federal law to outlaw political gerrymandering. Done. We need to roll back every racist voter suppression law in this country. It's not right. And just one more. It's time to overturn Citizens United. Democracy is not for sale. So there it is. I just want three things. <laughs> Attack the corruption head on. Get some structural change in our economy and protect our democracy. And I know for a lot of people that sounds like three unrelated things. But not to me. To me, this is about opportunity. And who's going to get opportunity in a 21st century America? Is opportunity going to be something that will just be reserved for those born into privilege? Or are we going to be in America where every single child has the opportunity for a first-rate education? Opportunity. I get it. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I was a special education teacher. Opportunity may be about an opportunity to live independently. It may be about an opportunity to move back to a small town, knowing you can take a little lower wage because you're not getting rolled over by student loan debt. Opportunity may be an opportunity to start your own business, start your own farm. Opportunity may be an opportunity to love who you love and build the family you want to build. I want to be an America of opportunity, not for some, but an America of opportunity for everyone, wherever they live, however they grew up, whatever family they were born into. That's the amazing thing we could do in America. And here's the thing, why it matters so much to me. Um, my daddy ended up as a janitor. But his baby daughter got the opportunity. The opportunity to become a public school teacher. The opportunity to become a college professor. The opportunity to become a United States Senator. And the opportunity to become a candidate for President of the United States of America. I believe in dreaming big and fighting hard. Thank you. Thank you. Q&A, do we have some folks lined up for questions? Do we? Did we draw numbers first? Great. Come on over. Okay, I think someone's checking his bingo card here. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh. 
Hi, thank you for coming to Knoxville. Thank you. My name is Richard Bain. Hi, uh, Richard. Several questions that I came up with, but this is the one I'll ask. Okay. Uh, the current president has been incredibly effective at hollowing out the bureaucracy mm -hmm. and removing the career you know, bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. No candidate is going to run on restoring bureaucracy. I get that. <laughs> What's your plan to do it? So that is a great question. Can I actually add to it a little bit? Sure. It's not just hollowing out the people who do the work. It's particularly targeting the scientists and the people who do data work. The people who actually talk about reality, right? Uh, we saw this right after the inauguration when uh, various government agencies started pulling down the, the information, the science information. And can we just make a pitch for why that is so deeply undermining for building a future in this country? If we don't have good numbers, if we don't have good data, if we don't have good science, about what's going on, we don't make good decisions. And I don't just mean we don't make good decisions at the federal level. I mean the states don't make good decisions, towns can't make good decisions, and individual people can't make good decisions. We need all of the information we can get. And we've got an administration in Washington now that is determined to try to bend reality to whatever the president claims that it is, no matter how outlandish, and hide all the facts that might go the other way. So for me, this starts with making actually a statement that's really controversial in Washington, but I feel safe enough here in Knoxville to say this. I believe in science. <laughs> I will make sure that our agencies hire people not because of their political views, but because of their expertise, because of their knowledge. And I will encourage them to put the information online, to make it available to the American government and to the American people. And yeah, I'm willing to run on that because I understand the importance of having people in those roles who actually care about building the future, not just about promoting one political party or another. It's not about, I want people in here who are going to promote my political, I don't want them in there about a political agenda. I want them in there about doing what's right. And I pick science as the place to start this, but understand, it's true, you just keep looping it through, one department after another. So let me give you just one more example of this. What's happening over in the Department of Education? Here's, here's, a, here's a promise I'll make to you. I'm going to have a Secretary of Education who has actually taught public school and believes in public education. It's another place of using federal resources to try to promote particular political agendas rather than trying to help our kids. So I think the best way to fight this is president, is one, you've got to be willing to talk about it, and I'm willing to talk about it. You've got to be willing to get in there and fight for it. I'm willing to get in there and fight for it. Third part is you've got to be willing to hire secretaries and heads of these agencies who actually believe in the mission of the agency. So no more coal lobbyists to be the head of the Environmental Protection Agency. <laughs> anti-public school folks to be the head of the Department of Education and so on through our departments. I want people who believe in public service and believe in the mission of these agencies and carrying out that mission on behalf of the American people. And then I will defend our federal employees. I'll defend them against government shutdowns that disrupt their lives and turn them upside down. I will defend them against cutting off the pay raises that they're entitled to. 
somehow is treating their work as not important, and I will defend them against the crazy stuff that's going on now to try to undermine them, like transferring them from one part of the country to the other, just to hope that a bunch of them will quit. I'll treat them with respect, because if you go into public service and you're out there trying to do a job on behalf of the American people, you ought to be treated with respect. So, I'll address it for you. Thank you, Thank you. Great question. It's the first time I've gotten that question. It's a good one. Hi. Hi. Tell me your name. My name's Sarah Adams. Hi, Sarah. I, I live here in Knoxville. Fabulous. And uh, you may have noticed Is that. Is this your, yes. That water tower over there, um, the federal government kind of let us down with that campus. And my question is, is um, do you think that the federal government has a role in revitalizing small cities yes. in rural America? And how and what do you think that role would be? So it's a, it's a great way you frame this question, Sarah. And let me just start with a statement of values. Um, and you'll see how it connects to everything I talk about. I believe that you ought to have opportunity in America, regardless of what zip code you live in. Opportunity should not be reserved for big cities. It should not be reserved for the coasts. It should not be reserved for any single part of America. This is part of what it means to be Americans, is that we invest in opportunity for each other and for each other's children. So how about if I just give you some pieces of how we make that work, okay? Um, one piece for me about this is the importance of rural hospitals and small town hospitals. Um, when I put together a health care plan, my health care plan addressed, you know me, I started with the money end of it, um, how it is that we could pay for health care for all of the people in America without raising taxes on middle class families by one penny. And it actually turns out we can do this. It means we are going to ask the top 1% to pay a little more. We're going to ask the big corporations to pay a little more. And here's my personal favorite. We're going to squeeze the tax cheats up at the top to pay a little more. We can actually get some money out of them for this. So that's how I approach it. But to make the math work, you've got to think about what the reimbursement rates are going to be. So let me just do this for one second. I'm going to get really wonky on you, right? Medicare reimbursement rates for doctors stay the same, right? Nurse practitioners stay the same as they are now. For hospitals, it's 110% of where they are now because hospitals have to cover other stuff. But for rural hospitals, it's whatever the number is to keep them open because the critical role that a hospital plays when it's the only one in a big geographic region is about health care for every single American, but it's also about the survival of a community. That rural hospital shuts down, young families can't move in. You, you can't get to where you can deliver a baby, then people are going to have babies they are not going to live nearby, right? Or seniors who say, you know, we can't afford to be two hours away from a place where you get treatment if somebody has a heart attack. So I start with things like, what? What do we need? And there's one. So that's why the reimbursement rates work that way. And by the way, um, some folks say, oh, but you're only doing this at Medicare rates. Can I just pitch in? I really do get wonky on this, but I want to throw it in. It's also and reduce all the costs for those hospitals. So rural hospitals in particular have a real problem with uncompensated care. People come in with chest pains. They don't turn anybody away. But if the person doesn't have insurance, Hospitals on the on the line, right? Or the person has insurance, but it turns out the copay is in the thousands of dollars, and the person just doesn't have it. And you know, my daddy taught me you can't get blood out of a stone. You know, you, people don't have it. There's not much you can do. So rural hospitals have to eat that. They also have to run a billing department to squeeze money out of everybody who had a copay, everybody who had a deductible, and the insurance company's not covering. They also have to run huge insurance departments to fill out all the different insurance forms for everybody in here who's got a different company that they go to, 
right? And to get on the phone and argue with the insurance company over, no, you do need to see this. Oh, this specialist has to be brought in. What do you mean she can't get an MRI? Her doctor thinks she needs an MRI here. Hospitals are spending a huge amount of money on this sort of thing. One of the things we can do under my health care plan is we can say, stop spending money on that. Health care decisions should be about the patient and the doctor, nurse practitioner, mental health professional, physical therapist, that's it. And we send one bill and that bill goes to Medicare, goes to Medicare for all. So that's how I think of this. We bring down the costs, we make sure they've got enough to stay open, stay focused in that direction. Let me do a second one, because I could talk about this stuff all day and I would do, unfortunately. But let me just make a pitch on what I already talked to you about. And that is the wealth tax. Think about the wealth tax this way. Iowa might really like that idea that folks at the top pay a little more. Problem is you can't pass a wealth tax by yourself. Why? Because uh, you don't have that many billionaires. <laughs> and even if you did, they're slippery devils. They'll just move out of Iowa, right? They'll move somewhere else. The only way we make this work is you do it for the whole nation. And you do it for whatever property they hold, whether they hold it in the United States or they hold it anywhere around the world. You've got to cover this from the beginning. So when I talk about something like a two-cent wealth tax, it's about saying there are places we need a federal government that is willing to be a good partner to your community. So as a federal government, we should go out and say, those at the very top, you got to pitch in your two cents. And then when that generates money, it follows where the babies are. It follows where the kindergartners are. It follows where the young people are who are trying to get some education post high school. It follows where people are who've got student loan debt that they can't pay. And that's true when it follows straight in to your community. So. That's the second part of it. And then I'll just do a third and then I promise I'll quit. And that is to think about every policy in terms of what it means in different parts of the country, different circumstances. So climate change threatens every living thing on this planet. The scariest thing to me is every time the scientists go back and recalculate the numbers, it's always worse than they thought it was. We always have less time than we thought we did to get back and start fighting this. So I see this as all of the above. We've got to be willing to pick up all our tools. The president has got to be willing to do, and I love saying this, whatever she can do all by herself. <laughs> That's a fun part. But here's a particular part. We have the opportunity in fighting the, the battle over climate to help farmers be the leaders in solving the climate crisis. It, farmers are right on the front lines and they're making the decisions every day about the use of their land, but they are under enormous pressure from big ag, under enormous pressure. Instead of focusing on sustainable farming practices to focus on maximize the yield for this growing season because we've got to bring in the money to make it to the next growing season and the next growing season. We want our farmers to be on the front lines, then as a nation, we need to pay them to be on the front lines. We need to make the resources available to them that they can engage in the sustainable farming practices, that they can be the stewards of this earth that we want them to be and that they want to be. That brings money into the pockets of people who live all around this community and that brings money into this community. So think of it that way. There are multiple ways we can make small cities, small towns work, but we've got to be willing to do it starting from a premise that everybody in this country matters and that as a nation, we believe that investing in you and you and me is valuable to all of us. We do that, we change this country, and we change it for the better. Thank you. That was a great question. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Dennis Johansson. Hi, Dennis. I live in rural Marion County. Uh huh. Um, you addressed most of what I had written down here as part of my question. Oh, good, because I talked for a long time, so but, that's okay. We'll take it as both of them. Um, what I, what I was, what I wanted to comment on in question sure. is that democracy only works when the community has ownership in the democracy. The yes. people who are voting feel that there's a part of it. Yeah. And in today's world, unfortunately, whether you want to go left or whether you want to go right, large portions of our population do not feel that way. Mm -hmm. And our current administration has compounded that problem. Mm -hmm. And so the question that I didn't want to know is how do we fix the problem that allows a person who is only interested in division to become president. And I specifically was thinking along the lines of campaign reform. You, know, you mentioned uh, Citizens United, but way beyond that. Yeah. How, how do we get financing to be in a manner that it's not certain individuals that are, are determining who gets the money to run or not? So it's a great question. You wouldn't be surprised. I got a plan for that. Okay, on, on campaign finance. Um, and it, but, if I can, Dennis, let me back up just a little bit. Yeah, we need to reform how we finance campaigns. You're absolutely right about that. But let's talk about something much more immediate. Let's talk about the Iowa caucuses. Let's talk about the Democratic primary right now. We are on day three of Michael Bloomberg's $37 million ad buy. Pause for a minute to think about that. Michael Bloomberg is running for president on a bet that people don't matter, only bags of money matter, that he can skip Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Nevada, and run enough TV ads that the whole notion of face-to-face -face campaigning is just made irrelevant. The whole notion of talking with your neighbors about the issues, about why you're in this fight, what you care about, is just pushed aside. You knock on a thousand doors, good for you. Michael Bloomberg just says, I'll run another $37 million in ads and drown your voice out. Think of this as we have a decision to make right now in this primary about which form of democracy we're going to have in America. Are we going to have a democracy in which billionaires and people who suck up to billionaires are going to be the only ones who can get the nomination? Or are we going to have a democracy where it's really about building from the grassroots? It's about engaging more people rather than fewer people. And here's the thing. Why this matters so much is it's fundamentally about who government works for. Because if the only way to be president in the United States is either to be a billionaire or to suck up to billionaires, we're going to have a country that just keeps working better and better for billionaires. And worse and worse for everyone else. But that is the opportunity in 2020. That's the moment. The problems in our country didn't start with Donald Trump. They were here long before Trump came along. But Trump has taken them to new heights. That also means more people are off the sidelines than ever before. More individuals are willing to get in this fight than ever before. So I see this as how do you want democracy to work? If you think the right way to make it work is person to person, go to ElizabethWarren.com and pitch in five bucks. <laughs> Volunteer an hour, but be part of it, because otherwise we're going to seed this democracy. We're going to seed engagement. We're going to seed our future to just a tiny handful at the top. So that's where I am on this. I hope that's helpful. Okay? Good, good. Um, let, me, let me do one thing. Let's wrap this up. I really appreciate the questions. They're smart and thoughtful questions. Before I let you go, I just want to tell you a story. And it's a story about a toaster. You didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> yes. So when I was a young mom, 
Toasters can catch houses on fire. Um, here's how it worked. Uh, those old toaster ovens didn't have shutoff switches, automatic shutoff switches. So you could pull out the tray, you know those little toaster ovens, you could pull out the tray, put four slices of bread in it, slide it back in, hear the baby cry, run down to the other end of the house, spend a little longer down there than you thought you had, and come back and the flames would be leaping off the toast, somewhere in the range of about eight inches high. Um, ask me how I know. <laughs> yeah. All I can say is uh, my daddy, uh, one year when I was a young mom, gave me a fire extinguisher for Christmas. Um, but toasters could cause house fires. Along came the Consumer Product Safety Commission, a federal commission, and they said, enough. We're not doing this anymore. You can't sell a toaster in America that's got a one in five chance of starting a fire and burning down your house. Um, and that was it. They put safety switches, shut off switches, and no more toaster fires. By the year 2000, mortgages had gotten so complex and so dangerous in this country, they had a one in five chance of costing a family their home. Think about that. Not fire, but foreclosure. Only this time, the federal government was not on the side of the people. It was so deep in the pocket of the banks that they let those banks keep selling those mortgages and selling them and selling them until they crashed the entire economy in 2008. So after that happened, I had an idea. And the idea was for a consumer agency that was about financial products, the same way we had a consumer agency that was about toasters and baby chairs and things like that. So I said, you shouldn't be able to trick families like this. So here was my idea for the agency. I went to Washington and I talked to as many people as I could who were in politics in Washington. And I largely said the same two things to me. First, that agency, that's a great idea. You, you can actually make a difference. That would be structural change. And second, don't even try. Big banks will never do it, go along. Big money will be opposed to this. Uh, the Republicans will all oppose you, a bunch of the Democrats. Once. You'll never get it done. I get it. Big structural change is hard. But it was the right thing to do. So we waded into the fight. We took on Wall Street. We took on the big money. And in 2010, Barack Obama signed that little agency into law. We won. We won. We won. And by the way, that little agency has already forced big banks to return more than 12 billion dollars directly to people that they cheated. We know how to make government work for people. So, for me, what was the lesson out of it? It was, even if the big money is opposed, even if the big banks don't like it, even if the billionaires are going to fight you, we need big ideas to meet the big problems of our time. We need big ideas to inspire people to Get out and caucus and get out and vote. We need big ideas to be the lifeblood of our politics to show what Democrats and who Democrats are willing to actually get out and fight for. We need big ideas to take back the Senate and put Mitch McConnell out of a job. <laughs> ideas and we need to be willing to fight for them because it's easy to give up on big ideas it's easy to sound smart and sophisticated by saying no no we can't do those big things but here's the problem we give up on big ideas we give up on the people <laughs> whose lives would have been touched by those ideas and those people are already in the fight People who are struggling to pay their medical bills are already in the fight. People who are getting crushed by student loan debt are already in the fight. People who are getting stopped by the police because of the color of their skin are already in a fight. 
And those fights are all of our fights. Our country is in crisis. And mm -hmm. media pundits and, and, and party insiders, even folks in our own party, don't want to admit it. They think that running some vague campaign that nibbles around the edges of the problem is somehow a safe strategy. But if all Democrats can promise is business as usual after Donald Trump, Democrats will lose. We win when we have big solutions to match the big problems that touch people's lives. I'm not in this campaign to, to be able to run some, some campaign that's been shaped by a bunch of consultants. I'm, I'm not here to offer some tepid solutions that are designed not to offend big donors. I passed that a long time ago. I'm here based on a lifetime of fighting for working families. I'm here to run a campaign from the heart because I believe that 2020 is our moment in history. <laughs> 2020 is our moment to win the fight for a Green New Deal and save our planet. 2020 is our moment to win the fight for Medicare for All and save our people. 2020 is our moment to win the fight for a two-cent wealth tax and invest in an entire generation of young Americans. 2020 is our moment in history. And if you believe that, I ask you, please, today, commit to caucus for me. <laughs> Be part of this fight, because this is our chance. The door has opened a crack, and boy, we need to lower our shoulder and run hard at it and be the America we want to be. It's time to dream big and <clears throat>